food for life, but your background mm -hmm. um, is as as a midwife. Tell us, tell us more about it. Yeah, so I started out as a certified nurse midwife. I actually right. was a student at the UH practice when I was going to finish my master's at Case. Wow. Um, and um, really decided I really wanted to be in maternal child health. My dad right. was an obstetrician, my mother was an OB nurse, um, and really knew that I always wanted to service women. Um, and I just didn't know what capacity. Um, I you know, found midwifery kind of later after I graduated um, undergrad and went back to school to be a nurse and then did my master's over at Case. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that was the, that was the joy, mm -hmm. that was that moment in time that I really wanted to be with women mm -hmm. was that, that, uh, that point of time where they become parents, right? They become, um, that I could help them through that journey and all of the questions and uncertainties mm -hmm. and nervousness and anxiety around that. I felt like that was a space that I really could help support women and not only during there, but really throughout their lifetime. But um, I've enjoyed a, a really successful career at University Hospitals leading the midwifery division and then taking over all the midwives in the system. And you know, over the many years that I've led, we've grown UH Midwifery to be the largest network of midwives in the state. It's amazing. Um, we started a really mm -hmm. successful centering pregnancy program, which has been proven to decrease preterm birth. We have the second largest in the country behind Kaiser in yeah. California. That, that, you're renowned for that work, and we know that infant mortality rates very high, yes. first year of life so crucial. And so you're doing this work um, helping at birth, and how did that lead to your new role? Yeah, so I stepped into, you know, in, in the maternal child space, um, you know, I was a midwife for about seven years before realizing the disparities that existed for mm -hmm. black women that I was servicing. I thought right. very errantly that I could provide, I could be a midwife and provide women with care and they would have good outcomes. And I was very naive and not understanding all that impacts uh, health outcomes and, you know, we're talking about social determinants right. of health. And so knowing that only the health care that I provide only you know, impacted their, their outcomes by about 20%, the other 80% are affected by the social determinants of health. It was a really sobering kind mm -hmm. of moment. I remember thinking like, gosh, I thought I was making a difference and, and, and I'm just not, right? Mm -hmm. And so it really kind of started me on this path to examine, well, why? What are the reasons behind this? Why are these inequities that are happening? And so led to a lot of advocacy in the space mm -hmm. um, for maternal child health, and that's what I spoke about nationally about racism and um, mistreatment of black women and black persons, black birthing people, and how that attributed to poor outcomes um, and, and all of the systems that uh, keep people down mm -hmm. instead of lifting them up. Mm -hmm. And so my advocacy started there in the maternal mm -hmm. child space. And then as my predecessor and mentor who used to lead the diversity space at UH um, was leaving to go back home to Pittsburgh, Mar Dr. Margaret Larkins Pettigrew, mm -hmm. um, just a wonderful friend and mentor, and she said mm -hmm. to me, you, I need you to do this. I need you to take <laughs> this over. Um, so after a lot of very thoughtful discussion and really thinking um, about what I wanted to do in the next step of my career, um, I stepped into the space as an interim, and I probably knew within a month, I'm like, it was a little chaotic, but I was said, you know what, this is exactly where I need to be. Right. And because what I had done in the maternal child space is mm -hmm. kind of what the organization was asking me to do uh, from a, large, a much larger perspective for the health system. So your role now, your title? Chief Diversity, Equity, and Belonging Officer. I love the belonging piece. Tell me about belonging. So our core values at University Hospitals are service excellence, integrity, trust, compassion, and belonging. And so we changed it to belonging a couple of years ago. I think it was in 21. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember having this conversation um, with my colleague, Tom Snowberger. He said, chief administrative officer he said we're going to change our from diversity to belonging mm -hmm. and i kind of sat there for a minute and didn't say anything and he mm -hmm. said to me he goes you don't like it i go no i just i wasn't sure if we were going to get here and he go and i said and i'm really happy that you think we're ready to, we're, we're here and he goes no we're here um, and what that entails. And how do we make everyone feel like they belong here in the organization? Um, how do we make sure that people feel like they're being heard and valued for who they are, that they can bring their true authentic selves to work? Um, and so that's really important to me um, mm -hmm. as someone who is a first generation American, mm -hmm. came, my parents came from the Philippines, and never mm -hmm. finding anyone that looked like me, never always being told, you just need to blend in, honey. <laughs> 
not going to blend in. And so, and I don't want to blend in. That would be our loss. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I see. And, you know, and, and that kind of work is, you know, what drives me in this work is really mm -hmm. for the patients I service, the colleagues that I have, mm -hmm. for my own family, for, you know, my children who are biracial. I want to make sure that they live in a space in which people, they're valued and seen and, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of lifted up for who they mm -hmm. are and not for not what they're not. You asked what our series was about. It's about health, yeah. hope, and healing. Mm -hmm. And it began out of the Surgeon General's report about the epidemic of loneliness and disconnection oh, yeah. and how so many things affect our health, as you're saying, the social determinants. Being disconnected mm -hmm. is has the health physical equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day, wow. drinking six drinks. So belonging is no small wor word. Mm -hmm. Um, we were talking about giving the good health care that we give as providers, yeah. but then realizing so much more is affecting your patient, your neighbor, the client. Yeah. And now we know we're sitting in a place, tell us about where we are today. Yeah, so we're in the UH Community Wellness Center at Glenville. Mm -hmm. And so it's in the first floor of an apartment complex called the Davis Apartment okay. Homes. This is an affordable housing project that we ventured mm -hmm. into with the NRP group along mm -hmm. with the city of Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Metropolitan Housing Association, and um, Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Okay. Um, and so we all kind of came together and decided this, this building, the school had been abandoned and um, there was a proposal for projects to build a housing in this area. So um, we knew NRP had come to us several years before the project to say, we'd love to work with you in some capacity, um, mm -hmm. with UH in some capacity in this. And then when this project came along in Glenville, which is not an area that has seen a lot of revitalization or investment, and when you look at other neighborhoods mm -hmm. around the city of Cleveland, we knew that this was the right project for us. And so created this thought and vision of having our food for life market mm -hmm. here. And then we said, well, wait a minute, we're just gonna have a food for life market. We should have a teaching kitchen there. We should have a community room mm -hmm. here. We should have for yeah. programming, how do we really engage the community and really utilize the space as a gateway for health for members of the community. We know there's always um, a lot of trust we have to build with communities, especially of communities of color. They distrust the healthcare um, system and mm -hmm. the medical professionals with right reason for based on the history of, of um, what medicine has done in the past. And so we know that we have to work extra hard to make sure that we're building mm -hmm. that trust with our community members. And so this is our way of saying, mm -hmm. we don't want anything from you, we want help. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not really direct care services here. We're not seeing patients in, a, in, a, in an exam room. It's really about helping mm -hmm. people navigate life. You know, social needs navigation is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. We have a community health worker that's here every day. And then obviously access to our Food for Life market and cooking classes, and they get one-on-one -on -one visits with our dietitian to really try mm -hmm. and improve their health. And so that's really, um, what we wanted to offer for the patients, for the people who lived here in, in this building, whether or not they were patients of ours or they're not patients of you. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So food as medicine. Yeah. Uh, food is. Yeah, food is medicine. You know, one of the things that we wanted to look at with the um, at with the start of this food for life market was really looking at not only food as medicine, but food insecurity. Right. There's a difference, right? You want to um, address hunger, you're going to give food, and maybe that food is not targeted to people based on their health mm -hmm. outcomes or their diagnoses mm -hmm. or their health conditions. And so we really wanted to do this as twofold. We wanted to make sure we were addressing food insecurity, but mm -hmm. we were also addressing the health needs specific to, to individuals based on their diagnosis, mm -hmm. whether or not they have diabetes or they're obese or they're pregnant or they have high blood pressure or chronic kidney mm -hmm. disease. Those are the things that we wanted to look at to make sure that we are providing them with healthy options mm -hmm. for them and really tailoring that, those, the, the food that we give them. Um, so when we started this first, this market was in 2018, actually at the UH Otis Moss Junior Health Center um, in the Fairfax neighborhood. That was our first market that opened in 2018. We've since opened five markets, this being the fifth. That's great. Yeah, and we have plans to open two more next year. Um, and you know, who knows where we're going from there, but right. we know that this is a model that's been working for our patients and that um, we know that we need to continue to provide these services because mm -hmm. as you know, 
Ohio ranks very highly for food insecurity in the nation, mm -hmm. and Northeast Ohio has the highest number of food insecure yes. residents as well as children. So we as healthcare institutions and anchor institutions, this was our innovative way of trying to address this that mm -hmm. was purposeful and thoughtful. As a physician, I might say, you know, your diabetes, you need to eat differently, and a person walks out of the room. Yeah. How, how does Food for Life come in yeah. in that gap? Yeah, <laughs> you know, we want, to be we want to be respectful of people's cultural norms of what they want right. to do, so we really try and make sure that we stock the market with things um, that they are familiar with, but mm -hmm. also challenge them maybe with things that they're not familiar with. But yeah. in doing so, we also provide them with cooking demonstrations, right. with healthy recipes. Um, I think one of our, one of our uh, produce sex selections in the market is uh, spaghetti squash. Mm -hmm. You know, I struggle sometimes with spaghetti yes. squash. <laughs> um, so, but we offer several recipes then to say, and then the, they do a really good, the dietitians do a fantastic job of, you know, making sure that they make that next appointment for the, yeah. the, the, the person to come back. And then they follow up with them, hey, I gave you a spaghetti squash and I gave you a couple of recipes. What did you think of it? A lot of times people will be like, oh, yeah, I really liked it. Actually, my kids liked it, right. you know? And so we, it's introducing them to uh, different things that they might not be familiar right. with, but also giving them the tools necessary mm -hmm. and the knowledge uh, necessary to how to prepare things. Mm -hmm. um, and then following up to make sure that it's something that they enjoyed, or if it wasn't, then okay, let's, see, let's think about what, what else do you like? Let's right. think about how we can tailor this a little bit towards you. When we say I, a famous food bank director once had a little bottle of medicine bottle, your uh -huh. typical bottle, but it was full of blueberries. <laughs> and how, as a healthcare provider, do you explain to people why food has such a profound impact. We think about losing weight, for yeah. instance, but it's more than that, isn't it? Yeah, it totally is. And I think um, it is about your overall health, right? And um, your health and wellness. Eating healthy is like the driver for everything. I think every every diagnosis, every disease state can be, back, can be brought back to nutrition and what yeah. you're putting in your bodies. And of course, I didn't always believe this when I was younger. Right. They um, don't teach us this a lot in nursing. They don't teach it to us, right? In nutrition. nursing or in medical right. school. Um, they don't teach us to give us a lot of those basics. And so I think that um, having, now that I've educated myself about that and seen the improvements in my own self, right. my, own, my own health with making sure that I'm you know, doing all the things, eating well, getting enough protein in my diet, making sure I'm getting enough vegetables in my diet, right. making sure that I'm getting enough sleep at night. You know, all those things, um, it, they do hold true. I mean, the things right. that your mom told you, right? Eat your, <laughs> eat your broccoli. It actually is valid, um, but you know, it's also meeting patients where they're at, making sure that we're taking into account their cultural norms and where, right. you know, what is important to them and really find out, really listening to them and what's important to them. You have research now yes. behind this. Yeah, so we just um, are about to publish or, or submit for publication our first study. We presented this at the Food and Conference Nutrition and Expo in Denver, which is the national conference for dietitians mm -hmm. annually. About 5,000 dietitians attended this. Um, and we presented our research uh, that we're doing out of the Food for Life markets. And what we found is that patients who participate in the market, actually, compared to those who don't, we are seeing drops in hemoglobin A1C if they, have high if they are diabetic. We're seeing mm -hmm. drops in blood pressure. Um, we're also seeing drops in unintended excess weight gain if they're pregnant. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is really important. As a midwife, if somebody is starting out with a little heavier BMI, I'm going to counsel right. them a little differently than somebody who is maybe underweight. Right. And so we want to make sure that we mm -hmm. let allow moms to live, you know, it's, it's a great time in pregnancy for people to adopt change into right. what they're doing. You know, you're right. very, women are very receptive to changing their lifestyles right. because when they're pregnant. And right. so this is a perfect opportunity right. to build in some healthy um, lifestyle changes, including mm -hmm. healthy food and nutrition. It's the relationship, though, that goes that extra piece because yeah. you don't just stop. It's not a one-stop thing. You keep the relationship going. Yeah, and that's the wonderful thing is that you can hear from our patients, and our patients have told us. Right. Um, you know, when we presented this data, we included, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, some a video uh, testimony from one of our patients as well as some quotes about how this has changed their lives. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 
participation in the food for life market and what that has meant for them. Um, what we've heard from our pediatric patients and their mm -hmm. parents, we've heard that it's made a difference for them deciding whether or not to get the medication for their child or putting mm -hmm. food on the table. We've heard from people who are, you know, parents, they said, I'm eating more vegetables and mm -hmm. so are my kids. You know, so we're talking about like generational changes towards healthy living and healthy out and healthier outcomes. And that's really where it's at, right? That's really what we should be promoting is uh, lifestyle changes and modifications and giving people the tools necessary. I mean, if you talk about food deserts and all the food deserts we have mm -hmm. in Ohio, certainly here in Northeast Ohio and in Cleveland, um, if mm -hmm. you know, there's not even access to healthy right. produce. And so this is a way for people to have access to healthy produce and really the and the expertise to help them on their journey. So this is really about health care, not sick care, which is yeah. a lot of what we learn when we're trained. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're actually preventing the diseases. How does that work for a hospital system to invest in hopefully not being needed? Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know I always used to say I, my, my job as a midwife was always that I hope that we would prevent preterm birth and put the NICU out of business. Yeah. You know, obviously it's not going to happen, but I'd love to see us utilize it less. And the same thing here is that, you know, what we need to shift is to really looking at population health and how do we keep people healthy at home. Um, we don't want people in the hospitals. We right. don't want people admitted. Um, we, want the we want people to be in the hospitals when they're truly ill, um, when they need surgery, when they need that intensive care, um, or they're birthing, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, those are the things that we want to keep people in the hospitals for. We don't want to keep them there um, because they don't have access to food. You know, I just can recall so many over the course of my 22 years as a midwife, people coming into labor and delivery um, and would come in with complaints or sometimes the same complaints. And it was that it wasn't, there was really nothing going on or their, their stomach would hurt, right? It was because they were hungry, right? right? It was because they were hungry. Right. And so how can we help, right? Like that is the, that is what I'd love to understand is like how can mm -hmm. we make sure that that's, they don't have to come into the hospital if they're hungry, that we provide food and resources to everyone in the community. Right. I mean, I think regardless of the differences we may all have, I think everyone can, can believe and mm -hmm. value the fact that no one should go hungry. No one, sh no one in our neighborhoods should go hungry. No one in the world ideally should go hungry. That we should all right. have access to food, that it's a basic human right. For folks watching out there, sometimes people hit hard times. Mm -hmm. um, for those of us who maybe experienced it in our lives, yes. how do you help folks ask for that help and maybe not let stigma mm -hmm. get in the way? How do you help folks feel the dignity of reaching out, of coming yes. here? You know, we want to make sure that patients and, and people feel like they uh, can come to us. It's about building trust mm -hmm. a lot of times. We've already heard from many of the tenants who live here that they've come down to check it out and mm -hmm. that they have, or that they've been patients at a different market within our system, a different food for life market, and they've transferred here because now they live here. Um, it is making sure that we are building relationships with them and right. that we're not here we're not here to be saviors right we're here to help we're really just here to help we know that everyone hits hard times um, I you know certainly there's been times in my life right that I was like right. gosh I'm gonna pay the rent or I'm gonna buy food right, right. and you know we, we I think it, it's more common than we think mm -hmm. and it that we and we need to just you know there's a study that shows that 25 percent of medical students are food insecure. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, these are people that are going to be doctors, right? No. There's people within our own health system that are employees that are food insecure. And we're really yes. trying to right-size that, too, that we do all this work in the community. And then how do we right-size that for the people mm -hmm. who work for us? So we're looking at ways in which they access the market as well. You know, and really to know that there's, there's got to be, we, we let them have choices in the market. We don't say, here's a box of food and this is what you get. Okay. Right? It is, it is food as medicine. It is really a tailored approach and really looking at that individual and what their mm -hmm. particular needs are. So I would say if people are interested in getting connected mm -hmm. as a, a, in their patient of uh, university hospitals, they should talk to their care provider about access to the food for life markets. Um, and so the, we, we depend on uh, physician or provider referrals to be placed in our electronic medical record in Epic so that patients yes. can then get connected and then they're scheduled by our schedulers to get connected to the closest 
food for life market in their area. Um, and then certainly as we grow and build, we hopefully look to replicate this model all throughout the system so that there mm -hmm. will be hopefully food for life markets in their neighborhoods or close to them. So that's what we're really hoping to do. Um, this Glenville location is the first time we have a food for life market that's more community facing. It's not in our brick and mortar. We're mm. in the first floor of this apartment complex. So we are hoping to make sure that this is forward facing to the community. You don't have to be a UH patient that's to great. access the market. We will make you a UH patient because we want you to get that one-on-one -on -one dietitian visit, um, but you don't have to be, um, you don't have to change your primary care provider. We'll just have to figure out on the back end how we work with other healthcare systems to ensure that we can get those referrals in from those providers at their health systems to make sure that they're referred in here properly. It's going to take us a little while to figure out the mm -hmm. workflow, but hopefully in early 2024 we'll be able to make this really forward-facing to the community. That's wonderful.